This is Terms of Reference. I'm your host, Stephen Laddick. Erin Burgoyes is the project manager at Cambodian Acid Survivors Charity, where she is responsible for the delivery of all of CASC programming in the country. Prior to CASC, Erin worked for Acid Survivors Trust International, where she oversaw large-scale programs from donors such as the UN Trust Fund and Violence Against Women and DFID. Erin began her career in international development and humanitarian aid, working as a financial administrator for the Brookings Institution. I spoke with Erin in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. I spoke with Erin in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Hi, Erin. Thank you so much for being on the Terms of Reference podcast today. Um, I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Stephen. Where are we talking to you right now? Uh, I'm calling from sunny and hot Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Tell us about who you are. Can you tell me what it is that you do, the organization you work for, and you know your, your specific job, like what you know what your day to day is like. Yeah, um, I work as the project manager for the Cambodian Acid Survivors Charity, uh, otherwise known as CASC, and it's a nonprofit and non governmental organization uh, based in Cambodia. CASC provides free medical, legal, psychosocial support to survivors of acid attacks to help them heal and rebuild, while also working to prevent acid violence in Cambodia. So I pretty much make sure that all of the pieces are working and providing services, and uh, I also lead on the advocacy and prevention work. Um, and then, of course, monitor and feedback our progress to donors, management, stakeholders, and others. And now it's, I've done some research, obviously, and it sounds like acid survivors are something that's a special interest in you. You came from Acid Survivors Trust International, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, how did you how did you stumble into this? Is this a is this connected in some way to your life or? Um, it, I actually um, after I left DC, um, I was looking to kind of make the shift out of um, nonprofit administration and finance and more into the project management and substantive side of things. Um, so when I started looking for work in London, I saw this announcement for a programs manager position with the Acid Survivors Trust International, um, ASTI. Um, and I actually had really little knowledge of acid violence at the time, but after researching more about the horrific effects of acid attacks, I became very interested and applied for the position. So um, that's, yeah, that's kind of was my introduction uh, into the, the field. And so it was just the topic sort of took hold of you? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, and then once I started working with other organizations working solely on this issue, um, and then meeting survivors through field visits, um, I, I became kind of instantly committed um, and really interested in, in the work. Tell me more about the, you mentioned a bunch of different activities that you're sort of overseeing as the project manager. Can you give me a little bit more detail? What, what does rehabilitation look like? What does advocacy look like? What does um, you know, other parts and programs that you have? First, um, we, if we're notified of a case, um, actually uh, on Tuesday night we recorded uh, the first acid attack in Cambodia in 2014. And once we're notified of a case, we, we start to you know, assess the condition of the survivor um, can we treat them at, at our partner surgical facility um, or should they stay at the hospital where they are? And then when they're physically more stable, um, they'll come to our center for a medical consultation. Um, and that's also a point where our social workers and counselors can meet with them um, to provide some psychological support. And then uh, and then they just kind of uh, will they'll be integrated into our case management and uh, and then we also ask if, if they want to file a case against their perpetrator. Do they need legal support? Um, we help facilitate that. Um, so it's it's a range of services. Unfortunately, with acid violence, it, it's not only physically very uh, damaging, but also obviously emotionally. To, to overcome a trauma like that takes takes a long time, and I don't think it's something that survivors ever really overcome, but they know that we're here for them to help them through that process through a variety of ways. Um, and then for advocacy, so I, I've worked with uh, the media quite a bit on reporting of, of cases, um, sentences, 
challenges that uh, that we see in the implementation and enforcement uh, of the ACID law. And then also working with a lot of other partner organizations uh, on prevention, strengthening referral networks throughout the country, um, so on. Why Cambodia? I, I've noticed on your website that you partner with India, with with a number of other yeah. places. Is ACID violence, is that... A, 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 a form of violence of choice in Cambodia. Is that why you're based there? or? Um, well, when I was working at ASTI, we worked with six other organizations, uh, Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Pakistan, Uganda, Cambodia. Um, and I was mainly managing a UN trust fund to end violence against women uh, program focused on prevention of acid violence in women and girls um, in Cambodia, Nepal, and Uganda. Um, so I worked pretty closely with the country, including CASC, um, via regular Skype calls, chat, um, email, and made a couple of field visits. But uh, funny enough, actually, I, I didn't go to Cambodia. <laughs> um, but, you know, through through working with CASC, I, I recognized the work that they were doing, but also there, there was a really good opportunity to get the sort of on-the-ground experience that I was lacking uh, in London. And with the momentum of the passage of the law, I, I saw that, you know, there, there was a lot that could be learned from Kask's success. So when I found out my predecessor was leaving, I, I asked him if, if he had found somebody to replace him. And he's like, do you want my job? And I'm like, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> so I applied and interviewed and uh, decided to move halfway around the world um, without actually ever been you know, have, having traveled or been to Cambodia. But again, I, I knew a lot about the work they were doing um, and was just really impressed and just, again, saw an opportunity for me to, to really get that experience of w- what are the challenges and, and the realities of, of working on this issue, um, interfacing with survivors and so forth. So, And what's the size of CASC? Um, CASC has actually recently downsized quite a bit. We are at by 75 percent. You know, when we're kind of fully functioning and we had a larger caseload, we had a legal department, medical unit, you know, at least two or three social workers, a peer counselor, um, and then a a set of staff that helped maintain and run the shelter. Um, So, yeah, we've we've downsized quite a bit. We have just one one legal officer, uh, one part time administrator, one social one part time social worker. Um, and then we have three staff who are survivors themselves that help maintain the, the shelter. But uh, but that was mainly because, we yeah, we've had a decrease in new cases, um, which, which is a great thing. It's very rare to be put out of a business uh, or put out of a job in, in development work. Uh, yeah, so. I was just going to say that either means that donors are no longer interested, which I can't believe is the case, or you've been successful. Do you, do you believe that? I mean, I clearly think, you have less less caseload. Is that because you've been able to raise awareness about this problem, or it, has there been a lot change in the law? Or um, yeah, it's kind of a, I think a bunch of factors. Uh, CASC has done outreach in 21 of 23 provinces in Cambodia. Um, so through outreach, we would um, distribute um, information about acid violence, uh, immediate first aid, and other sort of prevention messages. Um, And then also uh, we started advocating um, for legal reform in 2009, um, and uh, that paid off. And the first acid law with harsher penalties for perpetrators passed in 2012. And then a law regulating acid, concentrated acid, passed last year. Um, So we've seen a 83% decrease um, from the peak year. Wow. Um, I mean, you've yeah. got, you're like the, you're like the poster child success story. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's 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 been a huge success, but also, um, you know, given the, the long term um, needs of of survivors, um, we have an active caseload of about 30 to 40 survivors that mm. we provide some sort of support to. So so we need, still need to make sure um, that we can provide that needed support to them um, and then should. God forbid, acid attacks increase again in Cambodia. We do have the funds to scale up again. Um, but we're hoping that the the acid attack this week is, is the last one for 2014. Mm-hmm. But. How much do you think your success, or let's call it CASC success, success 
is related to its what I call super niche. You know, it's focused on yeah. one issue. That's it. Yeah. Do you think yeah. that that's a huge factor? I, I think that's a really big factor. Um, CASC is the only organization in Cambodia solely working on this issue. So when we started to, to kind of lobby and, and press the government for legal reform, we weren't seen as sort of an adversarial <laughs> partner or, or, you know, they saw us as, as experts because we, we had been gathering data about the scope and nature of acid violence um, since 2006. We had numbers of, of attacks, motives behind attacks, where the attacks happened. Um, so we were able to take that kind of expertise and then translate it into a series of reports with recommendations and also learning from other acid survivors foundations like acid survivors foundation bangladesh which really kind of has led the way on the issue and then we were asked to sit on the acid committee that was responsible for drafting the law um, so that that put us in a, in a really um a good position to that eventually led to the the enactment of the law so yeah, it's, it is a very niche area. Um, while it's 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 extremely hard to witness the uh, physical and emotional pain that survivors go through, it's an, also an area that you can see that change. Um, and yeah, while it can be can be tough, it's also highly fulfilling in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, why why is Bangladesh a leader? Um, because they were the first to, um, I guess it was the, the first country where the phenomena kind of started um, because of the garment factories and acids used for treating cotton and um, so forth. So there was just a wide availability of acid um, with no laws or restrictions. Um, and uh, at the time, they, they founded, so they founded the Acid Survivors Foundation there, which was the first, yeah, first organization in the world that uh, was dedicated to working on the issue. Um, they also established an Acid Crime Act uh, for penalizing perpetrators and an Acid Control Act. Um, so all of the, the other countries that are kind of working on this issue have, have looked to them um, and how they established the law, what sort of um, clauses did they include, and, and yeah, so we've, we've learned a lot from them over the years. Um, I actually went to workshop there last month um, mm. with them. And what happens if you eventually do work yourself out of a job in Cambodia? Do you think you'd still stay with this topic and look to move to a different country maybe or something? Or Yeah, I mean, I, I would like to continue working um, in the field um, uh, of acid violence um, and maybe perhaps for, for growing or developing organizations um, in countries where it seems to be an increasing, unfortunately, like India, Indonesia, Colombia. But if not, I mean, I think my experience here and working with the survivors and understanding, you know, successful prevention and advocacy work can, can be applied wherever I go, hmm. which will most likely be in human rights, I would think. <laughs> my ears my ears pricked up when you happened to mention Colombia there. Everything that you've mentioned thus far has been sort of, you know, the subcontinent, Southeast yeah. Asia, uh, and I know that acid the availability of acid is related to manufacturing or some of those types of pieces. Why Columbia? Um, it's, it's, uh, they have, there's one organization that, that's been working uh, with survivors and they record about a hundred attacks a year in Colombia, which wow. is just pretty high. Yeah. Um, and also assuming that a lot of attacks generally go unreported out of fear of retribution from perpetrators, lack of confidence in the judicial, legal, police, etc. But yeah, it's it's um, like in Uganda, for instance, batteries, they're wet batteries, so batteries that you top up with battery acid, which is widely available and uh, is is uh, very damaging. So it yeah, so I think in Colombia, it's 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 battery acid that's used. Hmm. But, um, that's interesting. Yeah. So it's not a phenomenon that's sort of concentrated in a region. It really is a global issue. Yeah, it's it's, and then in the UK too, the uh, NHS recorded, I think, yeah, over a hundred uh, chemical assaults, which included acid, uh, in I think 2012. So. Um, and then there's examples like the Bolshoi director who was attacked with acid, acid right. in Russia. Um, yeah, so it's it can be it's just it's a breakdown in, in a relationship. It doesn't have to be an intimate relationship. Um, it can be you know political, uh, business dispute, land disputes in the case of Uganda. Um, 
so for a variety of reasons, but you have a, a cheap available weapon, um, then yeah, unfortunately it, it happens. I want to I want to step back and look at your your career for a second. You had started explaining that you started in administration, and then yeah. were you know you worked in that for a while and were seeking then to get into a project management role to get out in the field. My first question is, did you feel like your experience in administration, first of all, what was that? But you know, did that experience give you a leg up when you started looking yeah. for jobs? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think. Um, you know, I, I started off really in a, a, with a finance background. I worked as a, mm. as a bookkeeper through college, even though I was getting a political science degree. Uh, when I graduated, my financial experience was more useful <laughs> and applicable than than my political science degree. But um, but I think having Which, uh, you, you know, know I, but if if uh, our experience here in in Aidpreneur is any indicator indication, I mean, what we've heard is that people say come to development with a skill. Don't yeah. come, don't come as somebody who wants to do development. Come with somebody who has a skill. So that's what you did. Yeah, yeah, no. In, in understanding budgets, understanding grants, donor requirements, audits, um, it, it really, um, you know, because it gets down to, like, you, you define the activity of what you're doing. You know, when you look at a log frame, it can be these, you know, the, the goals or, the, you know, the, the objectives can, outcomes can be kind of, really out there, right? But you're like, what, what is the actual activity you're doing? And when you, when you do a budget, that's where you see, okay, it's, it's, you know, access, increased access to justice. Okay. Well, what does that mean? Um, <laughs> facilitate, you know, paying the transport costs for a survivor to go to the court hearing, you know, you, you know, when you, when you have that understanding, um, and I had been working on, you know, in financial management, for nonprofits for at least, you know, four years before I went to work for ASTI. So I felt that that, yeah, that, that gave me a, a big leg up. And then also in the, you know, when you're developing proposals and, and for projects, you know, being able to map that out um, and then see in the bigger level of what, what are you trying to accomplish? Um, of course, donors really appreciate when you have that, that strong financial background. Um, Did you, what was the transition like for you when you, finally made the decision you said hey you know I'm, I'm i'm ready to move on from admin from my finance position was it a year was it two years was it two months was it a week uh until you found that next position that you, that that we were able to move on <laughs> i mean I, I was really fortunate um with asti because i think they they saw that i, I was really interested and, and really um and i had been kind of interfacing with um uh brookings i worked in the foreign policy program and, and worked uh, with the uh, Project on Internal Displacement, which helps support the Special Rapporteur for IDPs. Um, so we acted kind of as a secretariat, um, disseminating um, documents, coordinating workshops and official missions and so forth. So I felt like I, I did have some experience, but ASTI, ASTI was like, you know what, we, we think you would actually be really good at this position. Um, you know, would you you know, do, do you want to try it? And um, and funny enough, the, the UNTF project, they had been having a lot of challenges with, with the budget. So when I when I first started, I was like, okay, wait, I can actually, I can do this. <laughs> you were dream <laughs> so I, Holy smokes. I created the world's largest Excel spreadsheet. Um, but it was also understanding, okay, how can I make this intuitive and easy for the partner organizations? Because I think they just felt really overwhelmed with delivering on the project, but then trying to make sense of, of where we were on. Um, just really showing them that, okay, I can create this tool for you and help you with this um, and make your job a little easier. Um, and then that strengthened my relationship with them. Um, and so, yeah, so it actually just was kind of a perfect synergy of things. It, it sounds like you've just had this serendipitous career so far. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I know. Knock on wood. I mean, I, I don't know. But we'll... you, you wear lots of hats right now. So you've now you've gone from ASTI to CASC. You know, you you were describing in the beginning how you know you're project manager, but that means interfacing with uh, you know, the the case study, the cases that you oversee, interfacing with the administrative things, working on advocacy. How do you wear all those hats? How do you divide up your day? How do you make sure that you don't get diffused? <laughs> it's it's hard because it, it, you know it, it can be um, like for instance when I when I was notified of this attack on Tuesday night. 
you know, it's I, I'm thinking about, you know, the, the, the pain that they're feeling, uh, the fear for, for their safety if, you know, if the perpetrator hasn't been arrested, um, you know, so that emotionally can can be very taxing. But then, OK, then organizing myself to make sure that, OK, are we yeah, are, are we starting to do everything that we need to do? So. Um, I, you know, I think just trying to be as organized can you, as I can. Can you bef- <laughs> before, yeah, before you dive into or, you know, more organization, but can you take us through that a little bit? So, you receive this phone call. It's nine thirty. You know, you've just finished dinner. Um, what, you know, what is it that you're supposed to do? So I, um, I notified our our legal officer. Um, I called her and I said, you know, this is what I know about what happened. It was still kind of, you know, the details weren't very clear. Um, so first thing in the morning, um, I got the, the contact information for where, where the survivor was, like which hospital, who is the police officer that's been handling the case. Um, so then we contact them to get a status of, you know, first and foremost, his medical condition. Has the perpetrator been arrested? So we're still, yeah, following up on those details. But then I, I find a photo, for instance, that one of the Kamai papers took of the survivor um, and then gave that to our surgeon and said, you know, can he be treated now, given the extent of his burns, or should he stay where he is and wait until he's in a more stable condition um, and then come to uh, to the surgical center for follow-up? So, yeah, just, again, taking all those pieces and trying to translate that in, into some sort of meaningful action. So from the medical response to understanding the legal response. So um, today they said that this would be the third case tried under the asset law. So, so yeah, so just again, I, yeah, somehow (laughs) (laughs) keeping track of it all and then making sure we're following up where, where we need to. I want to ask this question in a delicate way uh, because I don't want it to come out wrong, but, is that notification that you received and then being able to go into action and put your mechanisms in place, is that a nightmare day for you or is that a, you know, I, I, or is it energizing and you're like, look, I get to, you know, I'm taking action. I'm, I'm this is what I'm here for. Yeah. And in, in one sense, it's, it's good because we, we can try to do as much as we can to help, help the survivor and their family and to be able to say that we've, we've been through this before. Um, we, we know what, what's needed, um, and, and we can help cover that for you free of cost. Um, so that, that is reassuring, but it is, it is a nightmare day because you, you do feel just a lot of pressure and, and yeah, concern for, for their well being and, and, but in the flip side, we're, we're often notified of cases um, that could have happened years ago. Um, and that's really hard because you see a survivor who, you know, went, there's one survivor who was um, attacked with acid by a man that raped her. Um, and she had received no support hmm. or any services for three years uh, until she came to us. So knowing, you know, the pain that she's gone through and had to, support herself through all of that, um, even just very basic medical treatment that she didn't receive, um, that, that's really hard, too. Do you, does your organization offer you social support or psychosocial support? <laughs> um, I, I would say that the, the um, good thing about working in, in a niche area like this, I've got to work with every, almost everyone that's working on this country and their issue or working on this issue in their country. So mm-hmm. it's kind of like that, that misery loves company. <laughs> we sure. have an instant solidarity when we meet for whether it's like, um, workshops. Um, like, so when I was in DACA for this workshop to set a standard of psychosocial care for survivors, um, we had representatives from the acid survivors foundations uh, in Pakistan, India, Nepal, uh, in Cambodia, unfortunately, Uganda couldn't make it because of visa issues. But, um, but yeah, just being with them and, and talking through, you know, just just what we face day to day, and and how, how did you deal with this? And and I found that kind of solidarity and support among the other people that have been working uh, on this issue very uh, very important. So I yeah, I'm usually in touch with with a lot of them in some way, either sending them articles or documents that we might have published or just, yeah, asking, how are you doing? And, mm-hmm. and just and, get, yeah, getting that. And I imagine that, that universe of people who concentrate on this issue can't be that big. So you might know no. everyone. 
<laughs> no, it's true. I mean, like, I, I know the founder of the organization in Bangladesh. Um, yeah, again, it's it's it's. I've been very fortunate to, to find this this kind of niche area, um, and then to to get that support. And yeah, we just we just do that sharing and kind of collaboration on our own. Um, and yeah, it's it's that's that's been really uh, fulfilling and also supportive. How do you you know? I, I'm going to assume you come back to the states every now and then for a you know for a holiday or whatever. How do you? bring this topic or bring your career to them or do you is that even possible it's um well i've encouraged all of my family and friends to like the cask facebook page so <laughs> I, let, let's put, um, let's put a shout out right now i mean go like the yeah cask facebook yeah, page yeah we're, sure. we're still i don't think we've reached 500 yet but um but yeah i think a hundred of those likes are, are family and friends but um you know, so actually that's one way where they, they can see what, you know, the work that we're doing. Um, but it is it is hard to translate sometimes. Um, I, I think, you know, they, they see this, this sort of, oh, you're so compassionate. You have all this, you know, it's amazing what you do. And yes, it's amazing, but it's also um, it's also it's really hard, too. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, you don't realize kind of how much it wears on you or. Um, how it sometimes changes <laughs> changes things until you go back home and, and you really see that, um, yeah. So, do people um, concentrate in, in, in more on the acid uh, part of your job or the Cambodia part of your job? Um, I think it's it's kind of it was funny because I I had said I was moving to Cambodia and some one of my friends thought I was joking for some reason. <laughs> and then he saw I posted, <laughs> yeah, I posted something that I was in Cambodia, and he's like, "Wow, you actually really did go to Cambodia." I was like, "Yeah, I mean, uh, so that for some people, I think is just, you know, that's, you know, it's it's uh, it's a bit um, a bit of a, a difference, but um, but yeah, the acid violence. I mean, I think it's it's something that is obviously instantly emotive. Um, people feel, um, you know, a lot of compassion for, but but yeah, I think they. They recognize that it's it's probably a hard issue to work constantly in and interface with. So, mm-hmm. but I would say my, my family has been pretty supportive. My mom came for for a month, um, and she came to one of our survivor meetings. So every two months, we bring together survivors from all over Cambodia, and she just was kind of blown away by all of it because there was forty survivors there, and and I got to tell her about you know I I know a lot of their their backgrounds and you know sure. and what. What, what their life is like now and what it was like before and and the stuff they continue to go through. So um, I was really glad that my mom got to see to see that. Let's do it for a second because you said you lost 75% of your staff over the last year. Where does your funding come from and, and how are you going about fundraising? Um, we've, we've actually had a lot of uh, – <laughs> we're fortunate in the sense that we've had a lot of unrestricted funding – Mainly, um, which is good because a lot of donors don't like to fund medical services, for instance. They don't see it as sustainable. Um, it's costly. They prefer to fund advocacy, prevention, research, mm-hmm. those sort of things. Um, so a lot of our funding comes from Singapore, Hong Kong, Hong Kong sort of investment firms with foundations. Um, so, yeah, so we've actually been really fortunate that we've, we've been able to have that flexibility to apply the funds where they're needed. But, uh, but also with the UN trust fund grant, for instance, that, that was really solely focused on advocacy and prevention. And during the life of that, that project, the, the law passed. So that, that was extremely significant. So, um, but then of course, to have that sort of credibility of, of a larger, a larger grant, um, and donor relationship, but, but I would say most most of our funding has been um, either private donations or through corporate uh, foundations. And what's what's the continuity of your organization look like? Are you are you sort of do you have a, a fundraising cycle that you do once a year? Are you always writing proposals? Are you, what's that look like? Um, we, yeah, I mean we're lucky to secure multi year funding. So we've yeah like we're 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 at a. a somewhat um comfortable space now so we've we've just downsized but yeah again we have the funds kind of uh parked uh, should we need to increase uh activities again so um we've been yeah i would say uh, we we have a really um 
close relationship with our, our medical partner. I mean, the largest cost is is really the, the medical support for survivors. Um, you know, it's it's the surgical costs, the the you know the the staff, the supplies, the equipment, and then the post-operative care from physiotherapy to pressure garments. So we have a, a really strong medical partner that that's. Uh, well established to, to kind of really burden or take a lot of those those expenses. Um, so, so that's uh, that's another reason where we can use the other funds to focus mainly on the psychosocial, legal support, prevention, and so forth. So, strong partnerships for the services that you might not have the resources to apply. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, we don't provide direct legal aid. Um, I mean, we provide legal aid, but we don't represent the survivors in court, but we have a network of pro bono legal aid organizations that we work with. So depending Mm -hmm. on where the survivor is and which province, then we identify which um, organization can provide the legal support. And then we just, you know, monitor and follow up throughout. But, you know, that's our way of of being able to provide that local support um, that we can provide. But, you know, again, through, through really strong partnerships. You mentioned earlier that, you know, you when you got into, I believe it was your uh, ASTI job, you came and you said, you know, you sort of created the world's largest Excel spreadsheet <laughs> to help your partner organizations, you know, create a tool that helped them understand their funding obligations, those kinds of things. What kind of tools do you use right now? I mean, clearly you probably use Excel, but are there specific tools that you use for project management or for keeping track of case studies or for advocacy that you think uh, other organizations like yours would benefit from? I mean, I use, I mean, it's, it's kind of basic. I, I just, I, I use um, my Google Calendar pretty frequently. So for everything that's happening during the day, like for instance, there's an ophthalmologist that's doing a con the survivor today. So, you know, that I put that on the calendar and then it says with which survivor, um, the Phnom Penh Post published an article about um, the third uh, case to be tried under the asset law. So I use the calendar and then put, you know, the details with related emails or links. Um, and then once a month, I integrate all that information into a narrative report um, that's broken out by themes and then that's then integrated into quarterly and annual reports. And then depending on, like, if, uh, if there's donor-specific reports needed. And then I use Excel to track kind of this, this statistical information. So we have a database that tracks um, the, the statistics of attacks and survivors and so forth. Um, but then I also track, okay, how many, which survivors received counseling? So we're not duplicating the numbers over the year. And that's also a good way of seeing, okay, which (laughs) there's one survivor, for instance, that we always provide like, you know, once a week they speak with our counselor. So you can see that the survivors that might need uh, more support for counseling versus medical support. So yeah, it's just using, using pretty much the calendar and integrating that information into narrative reports and then Excel for, for the data. Um, I also have an iPad Mini, which I'm a bit, which I'm actually skyping you from right now. <laughs> um, I'm a I'm a big fan of because when you're traveling, it's it's small, has a great battery life. I can, if we're on you know in a remote province um, doing a home visit, I can take a photo of the survivor, their scars, and then email that to our surgeon here, and then he can tell me if they need to come in for follow up consultation. Um, I can post photos to the CAST Facebook page, edit them, and I've actually even used some of the photos for annual reports and other external materials. So I found, yeah. And then and then it also links with my Dropbox, um, which I use um, for, that's mainly if I'm working with partners in, in the other countries mm-hmm. um, or for sharing, if we're working on the same document and so forth. So, Is there any, is there any tool that you wish you had? That either other can't afford or you haven't asked for or yeah I no I I guess maybe I haven't done a lot of research into it but I guess what we have now I mean given when you know the it's not as complex so we don't really need you know um, I don't know I mean we use a Skype Skype chat um, yeah I, I don't know yeah I don't know really about it no worries. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always I always end my interviews with with this last question. So, given your experience over the you know the last decade or so, 
what's you know the sage advice that you'd give to someone who's either looking to transform their career or looking to get into development and aid work that you believe has been critical to your success? I mean, I, I guess it's good to have an overall sense of, of where you want to go professionally, but you know, I'd say leave some space for unexpected opportunities or paths. And it, it is hard to, to uh, I guess, trust and, and have that confidence. But, uh, you know, you, you have to take a chance and push yourself. Like, for instance, applying for that ASTI position, I, I really had little or no project management experience. But given where they were in the project, they needed somebody with strong financial and grant management <laughs> experience. So, again, it, it, maybe that was serendipitous, too, in a way. But um, I was able to, to make that transition. But I, I you know, I wasn't going to apply for the job. You know, I thought, oh, there's no way they, they would pick me. But I also didn't know maybe what they were looking for at that moment. So, so again, to, to take that chance um, and, and who knows what sort of skills or expertise that you have actually might really be needed for that organization. So, yeah, and I never thought, you know, you'd be surprised where you end up. I mean, I, I really never thought I'd be living in Cambodia, let alone working on this issue. I mean, I, I had a feeling I'd be working on, on a human rights issue, but um yeah, I know nothing about asset violence until until I started working for ASTI. So, <clears throat> yeah. Aaron, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, well, thank you. I hope I hope it was helpful. You've been listening to Terms of Reference, a weekly podcast from Aidpreneur.com. Find us on iTunes or at www.aidpreneur.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time.